Well, good day there. Welcome to another episode of the Typewriter Video Series. Today, I want to talk about various things. I want to talk about some letters and emails I've received. Then I want to talk about a new typewriter in my collection. And finally, we'll talk about the upcoming first ever Albuquerque Type-In. Stay tuned. Okay, first of all, I want to talk about some letters and emails I've received. First of all, my condolences go out to Betsy, whose life partner Marshall passed away. He was one of uh, an, e an email correspondent and a YouTube viewer of mine who was very interested in the videos about the um, camera miniatura, the instant box camera, the street portrait camera project that I've uh, worked on intermittently. It appears that Marshall has had been working on a similar project since the 1970s, so he was much further along with it than I was. But my condolences go out to his um, life partner, Betsy, for her loss. Secondly, I wanted to mention John M., who sent me an email with an attached JPEG scan of a typecast, of a, of a typewritten letter. So I don't know if you call this typecasting when you email a scan or an image of a typewritten sheet. Um, type mailed e-typing, something like that. But anyways, I enjoyed the letter tremendously. I wrote a reply and sent it off to you, John, so hopefully you got it. And finally, um, one of my correspondents or viewers is Richard over in Sheffield, England, across the pond, as we say. Greetings. I enjoyed receiving your letter this week. And um, by the way, he sent this great uh, wax-sealed envelope. Isn't that great, having a wax-sealed envelope? And I did uh, open it, by the way, Richard, I did open it on the side of the envelope so I could preserve the wax seal on the front. But along with his multi-page uh, typed letter, which is great, nice quality, fine quality letter writing paper, along with that, he sent me three different uh, artifacts, I guess you would call them. These are old documents um, that were typewritten. At, and so I'll show you one of these if you want to see that. This is a kitchen equipment supplier and this is dated, I believe, if I'm reading backwards through the paper, 1954. But uh, this is a really cool letter, typewritten letter. So it's kind of nice having ephemera from the typewriter era of the kinds of, of work that typewriters were used in the day. But uh, it's cool, the signature line and just the way letters were formatted back in the day. I love the letterhead. There's a couple other ones here. Uh, one of them is, <laughs> is some kind of a uh, quote for a workshop. Long Eaton, Nottingham Road. So, Wallace and Company. Let me focus my camera here. But anyway, this is a letter relating to a quote for some cabinet or kitchen equipment repair or something. But anyway, I thought it was very interesting. And then finally... This is, <laughs> I don't even know if I should show this. I guess it's so out of date, but this is a um, insurance company. And it was from the Halifax Building Supply in Sheffield. But I'll focus this here just to show you the address. Hand typed. Isn't that cool? From back in the 1950s. It's really neat to get these kinds of letters uh, and with things enclosed, like little presents, if you will. And so um, I would encourage you guys, if you're in any kind of correspondence with other people and you might be interested in typewriters, type up yourself a letter, scan it or photograph it, and uh, email that, that image of the letter off and do some type posting, type e-typing. We have to come up with a better name than that. Okay, the second subject of today's video is going to be about, yes, another typewriter in my collection. That's number 15. 
I don't think I have much room for any more. So as I've said in earlier videos, uh, to add any more typewriters means I have to take something away. But anyways, this one I found at the thrift store recently in Albuquerque. And it is an Olympia portable typewriter. Now, I'll show you here in a second. We'll go through the, the typewriter and show it to, to you up close in detail. But I'm not certain of the model. Um, it just says Olympia and Olympia on, on both sides of the ribbon cover, as you'll see. And comparing the appearance of it to a lot of images I found on the internet, the closest that I can come to for the model number is an early version of the Olympia SF. It's also very similar to the Socialite, but it lacks the word Socialite on the ribbon cover. And it's also very similar to the Splendid 33, although it lacks that nameplate also. So I'm thinking it's the SF, an early version of the SF, but let's take a look at it. And this is the new member of the Joe Van Cleve Typewriter uh, Museum collection. <laughs> so it says on the ribbon cover, it says Olympia and Olympia. Now, if it was a socialite, Olympia socialite, this would say socialite. If it was a uh, Splendid 33 or 66 or 99, you wouldn't have this label, but you would have the Splendid name underneath the Olympia on that side. Um, but we don't have either of those, so I'm thinking this is an early model of an Olympia SF from sometime in the late 1950s. I have not crossed the um, serial number with a database yet. Um, so. Anyway, it is a light cream colored typewriter. I got it at a local thrift store. It's a pretty typewriter. I like the appearance of it. Um, we'll start with the features and well, let's start with the keyboard up front here. So it has, this is the pre-modern uh, era, I guess you would say, where this does not have the number one key. So if you look here on the keyboard, the keyboard, of course, lacks the number one. So like the older machines, you have to use a lowercase l for the number one. However, I think this is the transitional period in the late 1950s where you have a plus sign and an equals sign and an exclamation mark over here, along with a three quarter fraction. Uh, so it's newer in that sense than the older typewriters from the post-World War II era that didn't have a plus or an equals or an exclamation. But it still doesn't have the number one. You still have to type the number one. Of course, it has the shift here, here, and the shift lock, margin release, backspacer. This is a standard American keyboard otherwise with your dollar sign over the shifted four, your at and cent symbols here, and your quarter and half fractions here. If I pull off the ribbon cover, so it is a simple stamped sheet metal ribbon cover with spot welded brackets. Um, it uses these plasticky rubbery little bushings to hold on the, uh, the ribbon cover with the posts right here. Here is the uh, segment. It is a carriage shift typewriter. You notice there's no logo on the crescent center of the uh, segment below the ribbon vibrator. If this was a splendid typewriter, most of the ones I've seen on the internet, they have an S right here. So this one doesn't have the S. So this is another reason why I believe it's just an SF model. Uh, but anyway, there's the ribbon vibrator right there. This typewriter does not have a ribbon color selector. It only has one color and also no tabs. But other than that, it has the standard Olympia spools and reversing mechanism from that era, like that. Another nice feature is it has the little bracket with a hole for doing lines on paper. And most notably, this model being the earlier version of the SF, uh, the paper guide here is metal with inscribed white painted lines. The later versions from the 1960s had a plastic uh, curved um, paper guide. Let's look at the carriage section now. On uh, the back of the carriage, you're going to have your two margin settings. You pu simply push and slide. I'll show you in a minute. There is a, a little red indicator up here on top that shows you the position of the margins. 
And of course you have your paper release lever on the right side, platen knob, etc. There is a pull up uh, paper support right here that simply rests itself back on the back here with a little tab that you can pull up with your finger. This is the right side of the carriage. You have your platen knob here. This is the lever that disengages the pressure rollers on the bottom. This lever right up here is your carriage release lever that enables you to slide the carriage back and forth within the limits set by the margin. There's the paper bale that flips up. There are two uh, rubber rollers on the paper bale. This particular typewriter has three pressure rollers along the bottom front of the platen and three more along the rear uh, of the platen. So there is two a double pressure roller system, one here in the front of the bottom and the other on the rear bottom of the carriage. Let's flip it around and look at the other side now, the left side of the platen. So the left side, um, you have your carriage return line space lever which will push down into a locked position for storage and pulls up to deploy it. Uh, this particular typewriter has a the line spacing selector right here there's three positions for spacing along with a fourth position that disengages the ratcheting completely and the problem the physical problem with this particular machine is that in the single line spacing position which where it's at now it will ratchet three times it should only ratchet two times for single line spacing. Furthermore, that ratcheting is intermittent. It'll sometimes space two and a half clicks when you do the carriage return like that. So since I like to do a lot of typing with single spacing, what I've been taken to do now is I will simply turn the platen knob two clicks, one, two, and then push the carriage manually to do a carriage return instead of using the carriage return lever. This is in lieu of actually having to take apart the whole carriage assembly to get into that mechanism and fix it, which I have not done yet. But that is the one uh, real mechanical problem it has, but again, I found a workaround for it. Now let's take a look at the top of the typewriter. Now along the back of the paper support behind the platen, there is this plastic uh, scale with uh, numbered positions for the characters. It goes from minus, roughly minus five, I guess, up to 92 or 93. Anyways, um, behind this clear scale it are two red indicators, and these are for the margins. If I move, you can see the right margin is right there, and if I move the margin by pushing in the button on the back, you can see how that little indicator, if my camera would focus right there, Anyway, you can see how it will, it, uh, you can slide the margin in the back and the indicator in the front works really nicely. That's a nice little feature of this. And then along the left side up here, to the left of the left margin, is a locking lever for locking the carriage for transport or storage. And what you have to do is you can lock the carriage from either position, but you basically have to use the carriage release lever, pull this thing forward, and then you can lock it push it forward, it goes into the little notch and it locks the carriage. To release it, you release it, push it back, and now the carriage is free to move. Well, a good question to ask is why this typewriter specifically? Why did I choose to uh, buy it even though it wasn't in perfect physical shape? Well, one of the main reasons is that these uh, Olympia portables are pretty rare in my town. You just don't see them very often. And so I immediately knew from what era it was. Again, I didn't know the exact model, but uh, I'm still impressed despite the few mechanical issues it has. I'm really impressed with the quality of the typewriter and especially the feel of it, considering it does not have a touch adjustment. So it's a fixed touch adjustment. It doesn't have any tabs, but still, it's a really nice feeling machine. I got, I got to say, it feels better than all of the brother machines, all the Japanese portables that I've owned. It's one of the top ultra portable machines in terms of feel that I've used. 
the good and the bad about it. Well, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, the bad parts about it are this uh, line advance ratcheting problem. But I have, again, a workaround. I just go click, click and push it by hand, and that's my carriage return. Um, that's really the worst of it. I have a couple little type bars that occasionally want to hang up on the way back, and it just needs more degreasing and lubrication in the, the segment here. Other than that, it's really well a well-operating machine, and I'm really impressed with it. Um, is this problem fixable? It probably is, but I've noticed I did uh, an attempt last week to try to take apart the left side of the carriage, and it's really difficult. You have to disassemble the entire carriage to get into this, so I'm not ready at this point to do that. Not experienced enough, but I might do it anyways. Um, but I think this typewriter is good enough as is. Well, let's uh, take this little typewriter for a spin, shall we? Let's thread our paper in there. And there, okay. A quick brown clock jumps over the lazy dog. Again, that carriage return, it sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, but it does it one and a half instead of one. Pack my box with five dozen liquor jugs. Cl click, pull it back, there's my carriage return. Now is the time for all good men to Come to the aid. Of course, my carriage, the aid of their country. I have this little support block back here to prop up the typewriter for display, and it was keeping the carriage from moving. But, anyways, this particular typewriter has a great feel about it, even though it's not adjustable. Um, and I like this kind of look to it. A little bit more rounded and smooth, and I just I just like it. Um, you know, the later versions of this typewriter were kind of in the 1960s and into the 70s were very angular and straight and very sharp edged, and I didn't really like that as much. I I really like this body shape, uh, smooth looking, rounded kind of. Um, and I like the classic cream and uh, maybe what is this avocado green uh, uh, trim that these Olympias, a lot of these had. So uh, it's a pretty nice machine. Now I was typing up my notes from for this morning's uh, video on this machine. So just to give you an indication of the typing quality, but it has a nice quality uh, typeface on it. This is an elite sized uh, typeface. Nice and dark. Now there, there is a little bit of an alignment issue between the upper and the lower case. And I have not attempted to fix it. And the reason why is because it appears to be related to the alignment between the platen and the carriage itself. Let me show you. So if I thread a test piece of paper in here and on the left side of the margin, the left side of the platen, let's do an upper lowercase test. So this is going to be lowercase h, shifted h, and shift lock h on the left, and then the right side shift, finally. And then I'm going to do the same test on the right side. Rethread it through here and all that. So these won't be perfectly lined up, of course, but I'll show you here. Okay, the right side, standard lowercase, left shifted, shift lock, and right shifted. Let's see what we got. The grouping on the left the shift lock and the right shift, there's a height difference, right? The first uppercase H is left shifted, the last one is right shifted. Now, that, this is done on the left side of the platen. 
This is the same test in the same order, but done on the right side of the platen. And you can see the difference between the first capital H and the last capital H. The difference in alignment is different between there and there, which tells me that there's some kind of alignment difference in the way the platen and the carriage is lined up. And that probably has something to do with the fact that this particular platen, if you notice, there's a little bit of play in the bearings of the carriage rail up and down and also back and forth. I'm not going to really attempt to fix that. I, it's probably out of my uh, range of capabilities as a repairman since I'm really just a self-trained amateur. But So this typewriter is not perfect. It has a few mechanical issues, but you know what? I love it. It types good enough. It's very satisfying, and you can put a lot of words on paper. And here is the sample typing. Remember, perfect is the enemy of good enough. Unless you're a perfectionist. All right, so the last piece of uh, information I want to tell you guys about is the first ever Albuquerque type-in. It's going to be on Sunday, April 23rd, 2017 at 1 p.m. in the afternoon at Nexus Brewery on the I-25 Frontage Road just north of Montgomery. I have a, an, a local artist making the official artwork, poster, postcards, flyers, but I have a little temporary self-made little flyer for you guys to see. The Albuquerque type in, yes. So Nexus Brewery has a great craft beer selection, a full kitchen. They're well known for their chicken and waffles, fried chicken and waffles and typewriters. How could you go wrong? We have dedicated a, our own room for this event with a wait staff to wait on us. So there should be plenty of tables and chairs and room and everything. So I hope you guys, if you're in the Albuquerque area, Sunday, April 23rd, 2017 at 1 p.m. Nexus Brewery. Um, I'm going to have uh, Mr. John Lewis, who is a the local professional uh, typewriter repairman still in business in Albuquerque, business systems and machines. He's going to be there or one of his representatives will be there to help people with their typewriters and give them advice on any repairs they might need. Uh, and I hope it's going to be a great turnout. It's going to be an exciting event. And I have a lot more of these flyers that I need to post around town. And also when I get the official artwork done, uh, I'll start spreading those around as well. Eat drink type. Well, this has been kind of a multi-themed uh, episode of the typewriter video series. And you know what? This is episode 60, six, zero. What is that? LX. Is it LX in Roman numerals? I think it's LX. Anyway, episode 60. Well, until next time, you guys have yourselves a great day.